This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hi, this is Shuvra Roy from Johns Hopkins University, and welcome to today's Neurology Podcast. Uh, today, we're fortunate to be joined by Sara Mariotto, a neurologist at the University of Verona in Italy. Dr. Mariotto is the senior author on a newly published paper in neurology, Significance of Myelin Oligodendrocyte Glycoprotein Antibodies in CSF, a retrospective multicenter study published in the December issue. Sara, thank you so much for helping us better understand MOG-associated disease, or MOGAD, and, and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Shivra. It's actually my pleasure for to be here. I think this is a great study and helps us better understand one of the challenges of a condition that's fairly newly identified in MOG-associated disease. For those who may not be as familiar with MOGAD, could you explain the current landscape of diagnostic testing? Yeah, sure. So now it's quite clear that to, to diagnose MOG, we need a compatible clinical phenotype, and then we need to find the antibodies through a cell-based assay, CBA. We have, of course, a different type of CBA. We know that we have to use full-length MOG and IgG as a secondary antibody. We are still discussing on which is the best one. Oh, we have two options, the fixed and the live CBA. But the question is, uh, should we use the serum only to test these antibodies or should we use also CSF? That's the question that we try to answer in this paper. And I'm so glad you brought that up. Similar to neuromyelitis optica, the thought in MOGAD is that the antibodies are produced peripherally, which is why we classically test the serum alone. Why did you want to look at the CSF testing in this condition? When we then published our first paper on CSF analysis in neurology in 2019, actually at that time I saw a young girl who had a longitudinally extensive myelitis and she was negative in serum for both MOG and aquaporin-4. And it was so difficult and we need to find out a diagnosis. So I asked to my colleagues to send us also the CSF to try to find out something. And we decided to test her for both aquaporin-4 and MOG also in CSF. And I was so surprised when they saw reading the essay that she was positive for MOG in the CSF only. So then we discussed this case and we decided to test more patients, more samples to see if this was a unique case or not. And then we started more and more patients. Actually, we started them we tested them only in our unit. So we collected some more patients and we saw that there were more patients with a compatible phenotype who were positive in the CSF only. And we reported these three cases in neurology, as I said, in the first paper. Then we decided to design this multicenter study to better understand the topic. And this is how this paper came out. Before we get into the actual design and the results of the study, I think one of the things that I thought was interesting is, as you just pointed out, this was a multi-center study conducted internationally. And you also pointed out the utility of fixed and live cell-based assays and perhaps some of the the differences in, in diagnostic utility there. Could you comment on the availability of MOG IgG testing currently How can clinicians best get testing completed if they have a suspicion for MOG-associated disease? It was actually a multi-center study because we included 11 centers worldwide. And of course, it was uh, not easy to design it because it's usually difficult to design multi-center study, but all the colleagues were very happy to collaborate and they did a great job. So the point is that the test, of course, is not available everywhere. And we are actually working on this diagnostic process to improve MOG diagnosis worldwide. So I think that for the future, it's very much important to widespread the availability of this assay and also for a second option to have the live CBA in parallel with the fixed CBA. I want to ask you about your work in this study. Could you tell us about the design of the study and are there any particular strengths that you want to highlight? One of the main strengths of the study is that we included quite a large number of patients, 255 cases, which means that, uh, of course, we had to design a multicenter, although retrospective study, but uh, all colleagues were very, very happy to join with many different patients. Another point is that we included a pediatric patients, so we had both pediatric and adult cases, and uh, we included centers with a high clinical and also lab expertise. 
So what did you find as you investigated these different samples? Yeah, so the main finding was that uh, CSF mug positivity is common and associated with a more severe phenotype. Uh, it's common either isolated or combined with serum positivity. This is, I think, is the main finding. So among the whole court, we observed that 57% of cases were positive in both serum and CSF, 31% were positive in serum only, and 12%, which means 31 cases, were positive in the CSF only. So I think this is the most important finding. Among these CSF-only positive cases, most of them had a phenotype compatible with MOGAT because eight had NMOSD, seronegative for aquaporin-4, nine had encephalitis, four had isolated optic neuritis, four isolated myelitis, and two combined optic neuritis and myelitis. Another point is that most of them were adults, only four were children. Most of them had symptoms of myelitis, and they had an increased disability at last follow-up in compare to seropositive-only cases. You found a significant difference in age amongst patients who are MOG antibody seronegative but CSF positive, as well as their level of disability. Why do you think that is, and, and what does it mean for us clinically? Yeah, uh, we do not have a definite uh, explanation of that. But as for disability, oh, it can be linked with the presence of myelitis in most of them, but also maybe it could be linked with the intrathecal production of the antibodies, which could probably lead with an increased disability. As for age, oh, we know that the MOGAT phenotype is different in children and adults, so I think it's not so unexpected that um, also the presence of the antibodies in the CSF can be different among the two populations. Did you find any change in risk of relapse? This is one of the most disappointing points because I think that one of the most important things in MOGAD is to try to predict which will be the patients who will relapse and the ones will we have a monophasic disease course because we know that half of them will relapse but we do not know which ones. Unfortunately, the presence of the antibodies in the CSF do not predict a relapsing disease course. So we need to find out something else for this. One of the more striking findings that I was surprised by with this study was that even amongst patients who are MOG seropositive, you found clinical differences between patients who are CSF positive versus CSF negative. Can you explain those for our listeners? This means that uh, it's important to test probably MOG antibodies in the CSF also in patients who are seropositive. We noted that CSF positive cases had increased EDSS at nadir, more common symptoms of myelitis, and more commonly, spin tearing dysfunction at last follow-up. So this finding could maybe mean that it's important to test patients who are seropositive also for CSF MOG antibodies. So summarizing, it seems that patients who have a positive MOG antibody in the CSF may be at higher risk of worse disability, more likely to develop myelitis, and generally may have you know, a worse outcome, even if they are seropositive. And so putting that into routine practice, again, you know, in evaluating patients for MOGAD, it is standard to send a test for the MOG antibody from the serum via cell-based assay, you know, preferably live if we can, but not necessarily from the CSF. And then we just recently had proposed international diagnostic criteria uh, that was published in The Lancet that say the same thing. I was wondering if you could take me through an exercise, you know, based off the findings that you found in this study. Say I have a patient with acute disseminated encephalomyelitis or an adult with bilateral optic neuritis and or evidence of a longitudinally extensive inflammatory transverse myelopathy, and I have a strong suspicion for MOG-associated disease. Take me through your diagnostic approach for such a patient. How do you think your results should alter the perspective of clinicians when evaluating and caring for these patients? Yeah, so I think that uh, in this case, uh, according to our results, uh, we could perform a CSF tap uh, because we can take uh, several information for that and we can analyze the antibodies in both serum and CSF. In any case, even if the serum is positive, testing the CSF in both cases that you mentioned could add, I think, uh, some important findings. And it's great that you mentioned the diagnostic criteria because they gave a big advance, of course, in the MOGAD diagnosis and they also mentioned the testing CSF as a promising analysis. And among these criteria, 
CSF positivity is assimilated to a, the presence of antibodies in serum with no titer or with low titer. So if you have CSF mug positivity, you have, of course, to have a clinical demyelinating compatible event, but you also need to have one or more clinical or radiological compatible features. So it's important because I think that uh, after our paper into the criteria, they mentioned the presence of the antibodies in the CSF as a possible diagnostic tool. Absolutely. And I think we all hope that with this, it makes it much easier to be able to identify patients who may have MOG-associated disease and then better identify them to follow and manage clinically. So this has been really illuminating conversation on my end. And again, for those who are interested and want to read a little bit more, the published paper in the December edition of Neurology is Significance of Myelin Oligodendrocyte Glycoprotein Antibodies in CSF, a Retrospective Multicenter Study. Sara, thank you so much for taking the time and, and for taking us through your work. My great pleasure. Thank you. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, or you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about. The views and opinions of the participants in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the journal Neurology or the AAN. Disclosures of the participants are included in the show descriptions reached by a link on the neurology.org website.